somewhat differently from uh, some of the other talks, uh, my stepping stone, my initial uh, approach to this uh, paper was from a contemporary philosophy of biology, in which there is a view, an emerging view, uh, mostly propagated by uh, John Dupre and Nicholson, uh, that biology should be fundamentally based in processes rather than any kind of substances. So it's not organisms or uh, uh, creatures or entities or whatever that's, uh, that is substantial that should be basis of biology, but it's processes. So they give an example of a liver and, a, and they say, outside a very specialized laboratory, a hepatocyte can persist only in liver. And recipro uh, reciprocally, in order to persist, a liver requires both an organism in which it resides and the hypotosis of which it is composed. A key point in uh, that uh, a key point is that these reciprocal dependencies are not merely structural, but are also grounded in activity. So their point is, seems to be that uh, you know uh, there is between the liver and the hepatocytes, there is a uh, mutual dependency, but that dependency is not merely uh, structural. Not, it's not only because they are in, structured in a certain way, but the dependency is such that it requires activity uh, uh, that sustains both ends of the, uh, both ends of them. Uh, and uh, Dupre goes as far as to say, you know, mechanical models, assuming fixed machine-like ontologies, are at best an abstraction from constantly dynamical nature of biological processes. So they would see organisms or organs or biological entities as abstractions, as snapshots uh, of uh, what is fundamentally always changing and processual. Uh, and they think uh, that this view uh, is only recent. It, it, it has basically no history between, beyond the 20th century um, because they equate all kinds of Aristotelianism with substantialism. And they say even the scientific revolution did not bring anything new because I, mean, I quote the Bray Nicholson here, although the scientific revolution is often thought of as a revolt from Aristotelianism, it was certainly not a rejection of substantialism. A central reason for this was the revival of atomism by Bold Newton and others. So they're convinced that uh, there was no predecessor to this view in the early modern period and, and beyond. But this seemed to me kind of counterintuitive for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, early modern philosophy is certainly not all atomist. It is not homogeneous overall, so it, we could not equate, you know, all, all period with a certain, it, with one ontology because there were uh, numerous ones. Uh, so I, I didn't find this kind of a historical view very convincing. So I, my idea of this paper was to go into various periods preceding uh, their uh, conception to look for uh, biological processes and whether, whether they had any fundamental role to play in, uh, in, in biology or, or natural philosophy more generally. So one of the figures I came across was Robert Hooke uh, in his Micrographia, uh, which is uh, like very abstractly put, we could describe it as a work that uh, consists of descriptions of various bodies uh, and these types of bodies uh, or, or even phenomena, biological phenomena, they are described in an ascending uh, order of complexity. So hook starts with a point of a needle and then a line and then uh, um, uh, crystals and salts and mushrooms and so on. So it is described in an ascending order of complexity. 
Uh, and this is what he himself kind of professes. He, sees, he says, we will begin our inquiries uh, with observations uh, of bodies of the most simple nature first, and so gradually proceed to those of a more compounded nature, the more compounded ones. Mm. So he was kind of describing a, even a developmental framework where there are uh, simpler bodies turn into more complex ones. And he also describes the process that takes one to the other. Uh, so this transition from a less complex body or a less complex state of a body to a more complex one was for Hook, I, I would, what I found in his work, I would say that transition is a biological process. And so he describes uh, several processes here. He says, I do not imagine that the skips from one state to another will be found very great. So they are more or less continuous. If we begin from fluidity or body without any form, that is the most simple state of a body, fluidity. Then we descend gradually till we arrive at the highest form of a brute animal soul. So perhaps we cannot arrive at the rational soul, but at least at an animal's uh, soul, we can arrive through these processes. Uh, and making the steps or foundations of our inquiry, and then he lists uh, fluidity, orbiculation, fixation, angularization or crystallization, germination or ebullition, vegetation, plant animation, animation, sensation, and imagination. Uh, so this type of list is what uh, I would consider a list of fundamental biological processes. Uh, I kind of went on to semi-formalize what Hook was saying here without any, you know, intention to say Hook was doing it in this way. But uh, for a better, uh, more clear reconstruction, I semi-formalized the uh, the complexity of the states of the bodies for hook and the processes that take them from one to the other. So from, from fluidity and orbiculation, you get a sphere. From a sphere with fixation, you get residue. With residue and crystallization, you have salt and so on and so on until you arrive at the brute animal's soul. So the, what hook called foundations of our inquiry are more or less the processes uh, that take simple states of bodies to more complex states of body. Uh, and uh, we could describe this type of approach in Hook, uh, again, in a kind of semi-formalized way as process uh, is a developmental biological process, if and only if uh, the process is required for an organism O to pass from the state one to the state two, where state two is more complex than state one. Uh, this is more or less what I take Hook to mean by this. Uh, another uh, figure that comes into picture is Bacon, uh, because Bacon was also interested in the generation and transformation of bodies. Uh, and he says, uh, in, in every case of generation and transformation of a body, we have to ask what is lost, what disappears, what remains, what accrues what expands and what contracts, what is combined and separated, and so on. These, again, to me, seems like uh, a call to study the processes of transformation and generation. Uh, but uh, another uh, kind of uh, view of Bacon that points to the processual direction is the, uh, his uh, uh, his understanding that uh, human perspective has a prejudice towards stability over change, over flux. So he says the human understanding is carried away to abstractions by its own nature and pretends that things which are in flux are unchanging. So we pretend that what is actually changing is stable. But it is better to dissect nature than to abstract. We should study matter and its structure and structural uh, structural change. Uh, these two notions of uh, structure as schematismus and structural change, metaschematismus, 
uh, it has, I think, uh, some similarity to uh, Hooke's definition, but not necessarily. I think it, on its own, it points towards uh, a view that we have states, structural states, and then processes that take a body from a state to a state or take a structure from a state to a state. Um, so again, the semi-formalizing Bacon's view here, uh, P as a process could be a fundamental biological process, metaschematismus, if and only if the process is required for an organism O to pass from the state one to state two where state one and state two are structural and observed in their natural environment. And this is a kind of proviso that Bacon adds to his description of metaschematismus. He thinks that we should observe biological phenomena in their natural environment rather than uh, any kind of artificial environment. And uh, what does he mean by structural and schematic or schematismus is more or less uh, a latent structure that is not observable by a naked eye or by uh, a kind of common observation. And he even points out the very usefulness of a microscope. He thinks if we, if, and these were kind of rare in Bacon's time, as far as I can tell. So, uh, so he thinks that a microscope could, could be really revolutionary in this and we could really discover more about structures and uh, structural change uh, through microscopic observation. So uh, then moving on even to later stages in the 18th and 19th century pathology in medicine, people kind of took Bacon's term. I don't know if it came directly from Bacon or through some kind of mediation or, or a common source, but uh, metaschematismus, uh, the term, uh, came to mean uh, a de the development of one disease into another. There were two terms that were used kind of uh, hand in hand in the period. One was metastasis, which was a transfer from a from of the disease from one place in, into another. And metaschematismus, which was the development of one kind of disease into a different kind of disease, a more advanced kind of disease. So we have, uh, Hartmann writing in Theria Morbi, uh, the transition of one disease into another is metaschematismus, and that which follows from the primary is the secondary disease. There are primary diseases which already hold the seed of the secondary disease in their folds, and when the primary one, uh, one spread, to a certain degree, they will necessarily give rise to the secondary disease. So again, putting this into a similar kind of uh, form to the other ones. Uh, the definition would uh, sound something like a pathological process is a fundamental, uh, PP is a fundamental pathological process or metaschematismus, if and only if the pathological process is required for a disease D to pass from the state one to the state two, <clears throat> where S1 is a primary disease and S2 is a secondary disease. Uh, so, I find uh, I'm not necessarily uh, defending a historical thesis that all of these understandings were uh, necessarily came from one another or were influenced by one another, but definitely there is something similar in them. And the similarity as I see it is that uh, the role of processes was more or less equated with, with states of organisms and transition from one state to the other. And uh, this is understandably so, I think, because the observations available, uh, common observations by the naked eye or even microscopical observations were kind of available as uh, Dupre would say snapshots. So we have, uh, we can observe an organism at one time T1 or T0 and observe the same organism at a different time, uh, T2, T1, whatever we call it. And we could infer that some change has occurred or we can infer that there was uh, a process in between them. 
but we cannot uh, really observe the process in action, at least uh, when we're speaking about developmental processes, because uh, organisms take a long time to develop. And this kind of was changed uh, by Walter Fox, uh, when in 1929, uh, he used a certain type of dye to apply to an embryo. And then he would observe that embryo uh, in uh, several days or weeks time. And he would, he would still be able to see which regions of the embryo developed into what kind of parts of an, of, uh, of a more developed uh, uh, embryo. So he was able to follow the developmental, develop, developmental processes and not infer them. He could actually uh, see them happen. So we can see that uh, the red and blue parts of, the, of an earlier embryo stage transfer into a more developed one. And, and uh, so Focht was able to make a certain mapping uh, in the developmental stages. So this, I think, gives rise to a different kind of uh, uh, different kind of definition of a process, which could be uh, P is a developmental biological process, on, if and only if the process comprises markers, some kind of markers according to their lineal uh, fate map from T0 to Tn. And I think this type of definition really introduces two key elements that uh, uh, Dupre and Nicholson, but uh, I mean, generally, what we, we would want in uh, processual biology is we want to base the definition on time and change rather than state uh, and complexity and transition between states, because states are still uh, stable, substantial entities, and the processes are inferred. In this type of definition, change and time are the fundamental notions. And it doesn't rely on any kind of uh, 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 stable states. And so this is uh, what I think uh, Dupre would mean when, uh, because uh, he says processes are extended in time, they have temporal parts, and a process depends on change for its occurrence. Uh, so it brings me to some conclusions, very brief conclusions, uh, that I think some early modern natural philosophers accepted that processes are fundamental to life sciences. They are perhaps not the, uh, perhaps they wouldn't say that biology or medicine is reduced to processes, but I think they had a good intuition that uh, processes are important and uh, it's not only that we should study the mechanics of an organism, but also the processes that take the organism from one state to another. Uh, however, the processes were conceptualized under a static methodology that relied on notions of organisms and states of organisms. Uh, and a qualitatively different methodology only emerged when uh, uh, there were techniques available to mark uh, parts of the, of the development and then follow them retroactively or prospectively. So we could mark them like Fogg did in the beginning of the development and then follow them through. Or we could have some kind of genetic analysis to take a sample from a already developed uh, embryo or individual and then follow them back. In any case, this did not uh, rely so much on or organism as and states. So these understandings, uh, understandings are somewhat different, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, early modern philosophers had uh, kind of all been atomists and had no intuition towards biological processes. Uh, so thank you.